Welcome to the Future of Field Service podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Nicastro. Today, we're going to have a very interesting conversation about the neuroscience of leading through change. If you've been following the podcast or our uh, website content for long, you know that change management is one of the biggest topics we discuss because it is one of the biggest challenges uh, that you all have. Um, So uh, we're going to have a great conversation about that today. I am thrilled to be joined um, by Dr. Elizabeth Moran, who is formerly the Vice President of Global Talent Development at ADP. Um, She's an experienced leader, consultant, and executive coach, um, passionate about helping teams and organizations successfully navigate through change. Um, With her organization, Elizabeth Moran, I should have asked if it's Moran or Moran, but I'm going to keep Moran. We'll find out momentarily. (laughs) Moran, transformation. Dr. Moran uh, partners with Fortune 500 companies um, all the way to technology startups um, and uh, works to support everything from large scale to small scale transformations. Um, She holds a master's and doctoral degree in clinical psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies, a PCC level coaching certification from the International Coaching Federation and a certification as a neurotransformational coach. She's also the author of um, the upcoming uh, release um, or maybe brand new release, uh, Forward, Leading Your Team Through Change. Oh, that was a mouthful. Thank you for for bearing with me. Um, Moran, got it. And if it's okay, I'll switch to Elizabeth. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Okay. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, that was a lot uh, to cover, but obviously, um, you know, you you came to my attention through um, your brand new book, which is really exciting. But then in, you know, looking at your bio, you have a lot of um, experience with very relevant organizations, some of which I'm sure are listeners of the podcast. So um, that's very exciting. So we're talking about change management today um, and, you know, how leaders, you know, tackle that. What do we need to do to equip leaders to successfully manage uh, change? Um I think there was a time, you know, where change management as a topic was almost like a project. You have a project. If, if, if you understand the importance, you have a change management process with that project and then you move on. Today, it feels a lot more like a ongoing necessity. Um, So what are your thoughts on that first? So I think you touched on two important things that people are noticing more and more about. One is that when you think about change management, I say change leadership, I couldn't care less which you use. Um, There's two pieces to that. And you highlighted the one, which is super important, is being able to manage the project aspects of a change. But then there's managing the people aspects of the change. And so those are two different things. And oftentimes people focus on the project aspects, rightly so, at the expense of, well, are people getting it? Are we setting them up for success, including leaders? And so when you think about the, that, that, that's important. The second piece that you mentioned is it's constant ongoing change, not only multiple changes, but so many changes are years They continue, they're rolling. And so leaders are faced with a change that changes and changes again. Actually, one there's a quote in there from Ashley, who is a service leader in the book, who who was saying, yes, that's exactly what we're saying. We're like, hey, thanks for this change. But just so you know, this change is going to be changing and then we'll change it again. And we all laughed, Mm -hmm. but it was true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I mean. You know, when um, when I started in this space, it was 15 years ago, um, it was a pretty, you know, I mean, yes, there was change, but it was a more static landscape compared to where we are today. You know, I mean, and and so if there was change, it was... Um, it was done, it was stable for a time, and then you moved on to something else. Today, it's like the hits just, they keep coming, right? If it isn't one thing, it's another thing, it's this thing, and now 
this thing we just changed is changing again. And then, you know, there's, it's just a we live in a very real time, constant flow of information, constant flow of, you know, needing to react, et cetera. So there's this, I think, increased intensity around it and also amplified need for leaders to really get a grasp on the people part of that change leadership. Um, so, you know, so the volume and the intensity has, uh, has sped up. Um, and, you know, I think leaders are reacting in a variety of ways, you know, some maybe in intuitively are, are better at it than others. Some are really struggling. Um, but we need to make sure that, that we're equipping people, um, to, to navigate this because it's, it's not going away, right. That intensity is, is likely here to stay. And, um, yeah. So, um, in your book, here's where I want to start. And then I want to get into, to some of the details. So in your book, um, you are giving five simplified neuroscience concepts that every change leader can and should use to their advantage. So let's use that as a starting point. If you can talk us through those five concepts. Sure. So the first thing I tried to do with the book is to understand that everybody is overwhelmed. And so it was very important to me to provide something where it wasn't just, hey, here's the concept. One, two, here are some things you can do, which is why I call it a playbook. So here are some steps. And then number three, which to me was often missing, is here are the words you can say. So you want to have you have to have a difficult conversation with somebody that you think might be resisting. Here's how you approach that. Or when you announce a change or you're going, you know, to have to talk to your team, here are most likely the common tough questions you're going to get and here are ways to answer it. So mm -hmm. first of all, so we even want to think about the neuroscience concept. They are five concepts with the caveat that, look, we are learning so much all the time. It, it, everything changes. But I tried to give a simple overview and then like, so what? What does this mean for you? So I'm going to, you know, look at the book. It's so make sure I capture all five. So the first one was what we call the threat of uncertainty. And that ultimately is what the change leaders themselves are experiencing as much as people are. Our brains hate uncertainty more than anything. And so the goal is if we know this about ourselves, how do leaders create um when I say certainty, I don't mean that, that that means that they know everything, but that means two things. One is when people are already in uncertainty, they think the next thing that is going to happen, in other words, what's in the unknown is going to be bad. So part of the mm -hmm. leader's job is to know that we're already geared towards the negative. So how do you help people course correct back to neutral? And there's techniques to do that also for ourselves. Right. So that's super important. And then the other thing is when you think about telling your team what's known, it's just as important to say what's unknown. Because most people are thinking about ultimately the first question that runs through anybody's mind is what does this change mean for me? And so that's why we talked about it's totally fine to say I don't know. And we'll get more into that later. The second concept is negativity bias. That means we are... <laughs> We automatically have a brain that's tilted towards looking for that. We started with uncertainty. Now we're automatically tilted to what's going to go wrong. And that's just a way that we're always hardwired to protect ourselves. So why it's so important to not only think about what could go wrong in a change and allow your people to talk about it. It's also important to basically think about, well, what could go right? Okay. Mm -hmm. The third thing is switch costs. And many times I hear from service leaders, leaders in general, but service leaders, particularly if they have employees who've been around for a long time, is, oh, my gosh, it's like the people, they don't want to change. It's so hard to get people to change. And so this gives uh, leaders an understanding about why. So I like to say there's a little geek in your brain that's calculating like the cost benefit analysis for you to make the effort to change. 
And so a lot of times we like to stay in the ideation phase. Oh, that sounds great. That'd be so cool. But actually when it comes to doing the work, and I give an example in the book of when I tried to learn a foreign language, sounded like a great idea when I was living in Italy. My brain was like, it's not happening. Didn't matter how mm-hmm. kind the Italian people were, wasn't going to happen. The switch cost was too great. So then I talked to leaders, well, how do you deal with this? And one way you deal with it is helping people understand what they can get rewarded for. So in this case, Mm -hmm. what we're looking for is not perfection in somebody doing a task or doing it the exact same way we've done. It's we're going to reward people trying something new. And that's a way you can counteract. You want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say one thing on that, because, you know, sometimes one of the, the, the challenges I hear is, um, in that ideation phase. Okay. So, so let's say digital transformation, we're, we're adopting this new tool. Um, and we're going to do this. So it will improve X, Y, or Z about your Mr. or Mrs. Frontline worker role. And okay. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Sounds good. Um, sure. You know, I'll, I'll consider that, but then adoption, doesn't actually happen. So there's this initial acceptance when the change management plan is initially rolled out. Um, But then, you know, after the implementation of that tool, the the leaders really struggle with its use. It's not being used um, at all. They're just defaulting to the former tool or it's not being used in its intended manner. So this switch cost idea makes a lot of sense because initially in in that that initial acceptance is sort of this, yeah, okay. And then there's, you know, this recognition of, but I'm so comfortable doing this thing. I don't want to actually learn how to do this new thing. So I was just kind of putting it Perfect. in the context and, and thinking about how much sense it makes. Okay, sorry. Yes, you're absolutely right. And some of that is needing time. Um, but there mm-hmm. are a couple of other things that leaders can do in that case. First of all, is making sure is everybody clear, first of all, of what we're trying to do. Does everybody get it? Fine. And the leader can think about and make room for, okay, as you adopt this new tool, what concerns you or what excites you? Also, what might be gained or what might be lost? Giving people a chance to say, you know, I like doing this. I was an expert. I could do my job very easily. And now, depending on what some of those metrics are that people are being measured on, Right. So you have to make sure they're not being penalized for taking more time or having to learn a system. So it's really looking at the whole reward mechanism. But oftentimes it's like, yeah. And it's the leader simply saying, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. And just making some room for say it's hard to not be the expert anymore. And it is hard to take longer. So a lot of times the the leader has to just acknowledge. Yeah. You're right. And there's not much more to do about that again, except, hey, do you want to walk through this together? Should we try it and see what it's like? And then giving the person more time. And as we said, trying to reward them and encourage them for struggling as opposed to being perfect. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, Humans, right? This is a thing. We're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two other things. And they all kind of flow together. Uh, One is the Number four is the analytic versus empathetic networks in our brain. This was a huge light bulb going off for me and it gets to the heart of what you're talking about, the project versus the people aspects of the change. The analytic network is those groups of systems in our brains that are responsible for analyzing data, looking at time frames, um, you know, putting um, putting specific actions together, getting things done, it's planning, it's all of that stuff. Most organizations reward for analytic network activity a lot, mm-hmm. right? The other part is the empathetic network in our brains. Two major functions here. One is it allows people to almost pull back out of the details and see the larger, broader picture, which is a lot where patterns can see patterns. It's where innovation comes from, the ability to pull out and think about doing things new way in new ways. The other thing is it enables us to be tuned into the 
verbal and nonverbal cues of people. The kicker is when one of those is active, it suppresses the other. And so hence, when we're very focused on a project and getting something done, we are not able to attend to the human side of change, which why the best leaders who do this really almost have to specifically imagine they're putting a different hat on. And they have different questions, even in groups when we were meeting, um, doing training around this, and we were having leaders, service leaders in particular practice, we would assign, okay, you, your job in this conversation is simply to wear the people hat. You put yourself in the role of people. What are you thinking and feeling? And they felt permission to do that while everybody else was focused mm -hmm. on getting it done, right? So that's really critical. And then the fifth is optimism. And I hope this makes people feel good. For me, earlier in my career, I used to sort of roll my eyes at optimism or positivity because it just didn't seem serious. Now that I'm a complete nerd when it comes to brain science, it's, it's again, helped me so much appreciate that, again, we went back to because our brains are, are, are tilted towards the negative. Actually, some say we give three times more psychological weight to the negative than the positive. Again, you can understand our bodies are trying to keep us safe, but when it comes mm -hmm. to constant news and things that make us feel very anxious, unless we specifically try to scan for the good, we are always gonna fall behind. So in this case, practicing optimism would be getting your team together and imagining a positive future imagining a positive outcome, really taking some time to think about what's happening, what could be really beneficial for clients, even in the short run, if we're struggling. It also mm -hmm. is taking time to celebrate those, that movement towards adoption. So even if mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, I did this, it was a complete failure, it's still congratulations, right? What can mm -hmm. we learn from that? I so appreciate you take making the effort. It's wonderful. What can we learn from this? And then it's also celebrating mm -hmm. more of the traditional successes. So I'll stop there. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and I think, you know, I have, I'm looking at our outline and thinking we don't have enough time because I have so many <laughs> extra questions. But, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about the analytic versus the empathetic. Um, so I'm sure part of it is putting on those different hats, but I have to assume also people are geared in one or the other, right? And so I think, I was just thinking about like, uh, clearly I would be on the empathetic side. I, you know, that's, but that's not not for this conversation. But, you know, I, I think on the flip side, there's a lot of, of leaders who aren't, and that's tough. And knowing that the people part is tougher than the process part, then that it, it kind of exacerbates uh, the, the challenges. Um, the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking about optimism is, you know, there's, you're working toward whatever this, uh, that this outcome is, right? But we tend to focus so much on the end goal that we don't look for those positives all along the way. And, you know, I'm just thinking about when going back to um, the second point was around, remind me, the second point was around uh negativity bias Rested yes certain... and so you were you were say or maybe it was when we were talking about the switch cost but you know you said that you might not change anything but that person just wants to be acknowledged and so this is where this gets really interesting to me i i have um a degree in psychology so that's probably why but um i i struggle so much in talking with people about this because I think so much of where we go wrong is in really simple details. Do you know what I mean? So when you think about acknowledgement, you know, so that person that's frustrated with that feeling of failure because they went from a process they know they could do in their sleep to something brand new that feels so, so hard. The frustration there, you know, company leaders sense that or are made aware of that and they react in a way that, you know, is either panic or force 
rather than just acceptance and acknowledgement. And maybe all that person needs is to feel heard and feel validated that, yeah, I know it's, it is hard because it's new and that's okay, but we're still going to do this because of this why for you. Right. And the same thing with the optimism, you know, yes, you have this end goal, but work backwards from there, even in advance and think about what are the realistic milestones that you can look for to celebrate so that people don't get so disengaged waiting to get to the finish line. Um, so yeah, it makes good sense to me. Um, all right. So let's go back to your point about, you know, communication is obviously a really big part of this. And, um, you know, there's this need to have, um, you said earlier, you know, a clear message. Why are we doing this? And I think one of the things we've talked about before is also acknowledging as a leader that the why is different depending on what stakeholder you're talking to, right? The why for the CEO is different from the why to the frontline worker, et cetera. So you need to have this clear message, but you mentioned also that it's okay to be clear about what you don't know. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and you know, this idea of clarity, um, compassion, and then you know, communication doesn't mean you have to have all of the answers. Right. So we hope in organizations, but I, I still hear that it doesn't happen, that the organization is providing their leaders with some information, enough information that starts to answer some key questions. What's changing? Why is it changing? And maybe what happens if we don't change? What are the actions and results? Like, what are we trying to get to? And then what are the benefits we're hoping to achieve? Now, many organizations will have answers to some of that, but in a much more sort of big picture general sense. It's up then to the change leader to take that information and, and really be able to um, answer the questions for their people in a way that's relatable for them. If there is one piece of advice that all of this boils down to is take some time before you talk to your folks about a change and simply put yourself in their shoes and say, if I was in their shoes, what would I need? What is this? How is this announcement going to land? And what might I need to adopt? Even if I'm resistant at first, that's okay. So it's thinking about the the first of all just the overall consistent basics do you have that and if you don't go to your leaders and ask some of those questions then it is okay i'm going to communicate this to folks but before i do i'm going to take some time to anticipate um tough questions or reactions they may have so i am not surprised and then it is going to be okay, but it, it involves a mindset shift, right? Because, and I know I can go in a bazillion different directions because of the overlap, but I'm trying to stay focused. So if you think about what your job is in the different stage, stages, first is just to let announce the change, make sure people get the technical details enough, and then they can ask questions, and then they can have their reactions. So you have to get into a mindset that says my job as a change leader is not to have all the answers. My job as a change leader, and, and I know I'm successful, is I, I can actually unearth a ton of questions I can't answer yet. Mm -hmm. Because that tells me I'm giving my folks an opportunity to engage and to get involved. And I'm also trusting their wisdom and their knowledge. They're on the front lines. And the problem mm -hmm. is a lot of leaders are exhausted. They already feel like they're going to hear people being like, oh, are you kidding me? Another change? What about this? And this one still isn't working. And that's fair. And then it's mm -hmm. like, okay, let's map this out. Let's talk about that. And it's giving 20 minutes. Now, what I'd like to say to leaders is it's okay. So, so for instance, as soon as you shift your mindset that resistance isn't a problem, resistance is normal. This is what people do. That's cool. 
But resistance isn't a permanent state. Mm -hmm. And then over time, it becomes a different conversation. But at first, my job is to understand, do people have enough information now? And then it is to make sure I ask questions if I have an expectation, right? That is, do you understand what you need to do differently, which is the clarity priority? We can touch on those in a minute. The clarity priority, bottom line is, is everybody clear on what they need to do differently on a day-to-day -day basis as a result of the change? That's usually the part that's missing. A change gets announced. There's not as much conversation or clarity around, okay, now what is it like to actually implement this change? Do I need mm -hmm. new training? And almost making room for, look, this is how it looks now, but it's probably going to change as we start to roll mm -hmm. it out and setting that expectation up front so people don't think, oh, now you're changing again. That must have me mean it was a problem. No, this is normal. Um so I'm going to dovetail into the so the, the communication priority. So clarity mm -hmm. priority is making sure people are really, they understand what they have to do differently. Communication is two-way. It's not just telling, it's making room to ask. And that's why I hope the book is helpful because I do outline conversations and guides for a ton of tough questions, including am I gonna lose my job? Which is a big one that freaks leaders out. So it is all about mm -hmm. how do you become curious and not look at somebody's negative reaction as either a total roadblock to you're trying to move ahead in your analytic network and get things done, right? And also how do you welcome it as good data, right? It's mm -hmm. important for me to know this. And so as soon as I go into curiosity mindset, I'm not defensive. I don't have to convince mm -hmm. anybody. And then it's compassion is really where I like to start. As I said, you are able to understand that resistance is completely normal, that my job here is to really try to put myself in that person's shoes, which I've got to say, service people are so good. The most successful ones all the time It's what causes a lot of their frustration. As I said, they love their clients, right? They feel like they really want to support their clients. So how do you end up really allowing put yourself in your person's shoes, but then allow them to put themselves in their client's shoes and talk to you about what this is going to be like from a client or user experience perspective. Mm -hmm. So we're mm -hmm. talking about a lot here, but I want to make sure we focus down on that most leaders right now, they are already change leaders. They're doing it. So the goal is let's figure out what you do that works. And if you're coming up against some particular problems or challenges, I'm hoping this book can make it easy for you to try a couple of things differently to get that change mm -hmm. adoption. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And I think this idea of, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know, also goes back to um, authenticity, which builds trust, right? So uh, to me, I mean, I'm probably more skeptical than some. Um, but, you know, the worst thing someone could do if I ask a question and they don't know is to make something up because I will just smell the BS and just walk away rolling my eyes, you know, and that that disconnect is what you want to be avoiding. Like you're better off just being honest and transparent. I don't know, but let me find out. I don't know. I'll come back to you. I don't know. Let's, you know, whatever. Um, but so it, it almost is part of the the compassion piece for me of like, totally. don't let your ego make you feel the need to make things up. It's okay to not have all the answers. It's better to not have all the answers and figure them out together than to pretend you do if you don't, right? Um, now you mentioned some of the tough questions. So how do you you know, I, I want people to get the book and, and read the book. So we don't need to go through, you know, uh, all of the examples. But I'm but, happy to. I mean, <laughs> what is what is the advice on, you know, obviously, you, you should anticipate that you will get some. Um, but, you know, how do you navigate those tough questions or those moments of extreme resistance without let, taking it personally or losing kind of focus, confidence, energy on where you're trying to get to. Yeah. So I think the whole point is these conversations are hard. So what I like to say is, mm -hmm. 
it's not that you're ever maybe going to feel great about having these conversations or that you're going to like them. It is, again, shifting a bit to be able to tolerate the discomfort. And most people that I have found, they build the skill over time. And then they start to have a couple of things, which is what's, you know, what's in the book. So let's talk about that. So the first thing is, it's normal. So as soon as you shift your mindset that somebody's reaction or tough question is not a barometer of my change leadership ability, and it might not even be a barometer that, that they're resisting change or not. It's usually resistance is simply concerns that haven't yet been addressed. So if you can shift to that, that often helps again, as I like to say, what, as soon as we trigger curiosity in ourselves, that oftentimes alone um, reduces our own anxiety. That's what in the brain, it, it basically, there's a different emotion that's now in line in your amygdala and it's not fear or anxiety. That's mm -hmm. one. Two is if I've taken some time in advance, given what I know and prepared for some, some tough questions, like, like, uh, why do we need to do this when everything's going so well, or I'm already overwhelmed or am I going to lose my job or whatever? If you take some time in advance, there are ways to handle that. What I like to say to leaders is across the board, the one tip that will really help is stop thinking you have to give an answer right away. And again, the good, if we think about the kind of the, where I should be asking more and telling. If someone clearly is coming forward with a question that's very clear that they just have the wrong information, then yes, tell is like, hey, I think, let me just make sure I'm clear. So oftentimes it's simply playing mm -hmm. back, which is what service people are trained to do with clients, right? Let me play back when I just want to deescalate conflict. Let me play back what I hear you saying. Okay, great. Yes, boom. If there's more of an emotion behind it, you know, telling and start can start to get into a debate. So that's what you're trying to avoid. So first of all, as you know this, you can say something like, hey, that question makes sense. I think I understand why you're asking it, but I'd love to get some more information. Why is that coming up for you now? Or can you give me some more information? That does two things. It enables the person to sometimes even get clearer on what it is, especially if there's emotion involved. And so it could be, hey, what are you concerned about? I, I think it's this, but tell me more. So the leader is simply there helping the person get to the bottom of stuff. But that does require in that moment that the leader has already kind of come into it and said, okay, I'm going to take off my analytic network hat. I'm simply going to put on my empathetic network. Now, you mm -hmm. had said you probably more geared towards having a preference, right? Me too. That said, when my brain is focused on a goal, I'm on a tight time frame. I got another meeting coming up. I'm in my analytic network. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be much more likely to tell. So part of it has been very clear in this conversation. This may be a tough one. So I'm going to have some notes. I'm going to have a couple of questions I can ask back. And then I'm going to make sure I take time. And if we're running out of time, I'm going to say, hey, let's continue this. But the whole point is, can you ask a couple of questions first, let the person talk a minute, and then say, huh, that's a great question. If I was in your shoes, I could understand why you're asking it. So here's what I know right now. And here's what mm -hmm. still we don't know. The other thing that's really tricky here, and this goes back to the neuroscience concept of uncertainty. Oftentimes, it's hard for people when they are, again, change wasn't their idea, it's being foisted on them to feel okay about moving forward if they don't have all the answers, but leaders and frontline people. So oftentimes, it's important for the leader to say, if they are not able to answer a question, be very clear about, again, great question. I can understand why you're asking it. We don't have an answer now. Is not having an answer preventing you from doing your job right now? And if it is, listen, that's good to know. But oftentimes people just don't like not knowing and they'll feel bad mm -hmm. about it and they'll feel uncomfortable. And that's important for leaders to say, look, I totally get it. Your question makes perfect sense. Here's my commitment to get you an answer. 
But I think in the meantime, you'll still be able to do these things, even if it's uncomfortable. Am I right about that? So it's just mm -hmm. always trusting your people that they're trying to do the best they can with the information and pausing mm -hmm. for a minute and just simply joining them. Right. Doesn't mean agreeing. It just means I'm going to be present enough for you for these next 10 minutes just to make sure I'm I'm getting what it is that is important to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that distinction that acknowledging emotions does not mean agreeing with them is a good one. Right. Because people want that acknowledgement. They want to feel heard. That doesn't mean you are, you know, agreeing, conceding. You know, I mean, it's it's just a matter of allowing them to feel that way and feel heard. And, you know, then, you know, to your point, finding the, the solution. Um, OK, so one of the things I, I want to talk about um, is change fatigue. Right. So, you know, we have had a whole lot of it um, over the last few years. And I think um you know, service, we we had a big push of digital transformation and, and technology change. We've had um, changes in, you know, what are cus customer expectations and how do we shift uh, service delivery or business models to meet those needs? And then obviously, um, you know, the last few years, that's all been compounded by changes as a result of the pandemic, et cetera. So what what are the thoughts on change fatigue and how it factors in both for leaders and for employees? I mean, I think you said it beautifully. So the question is, what is it that will help both employees and leaders when it seems like there's no uh, um, relief really coming. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is, first of all, understanding that this idea, let me, let me be, say this another way. As soon as you understand that our brains are automatically tilted to the negative, that's really important information. Once you understand that, you're able to stop and pause. And stop thinking that just because your brain is saying, oh, my God, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, doesn't make it true. Mm -hmm. And this is the most important thing. 100% of my clients are overwhelmed and exhausted. And so the first thing we have to do is help them understand you are in habit. Most people's brains are in the habit of anxiety. And it's exhausting because we are not built to constantly be in fight or flight. We also mm -hmm. know little more neuroscience research that there's been research done about they did. They put people in MRI machines. They flashed images. So they were trying to understand, is there a difference between something lodging in what we call the unconscious brain, which is more of the inner brain versus the outer brain? And yes. So what they discovered was people's amygdala could be lighting up and flashing and reacting to stuff in the environment, even though their conscious brain wasn't recognizing it. So the first thing mm -hmm. for leaders to understand is you have to take care of yourself. And that may mean not giving yourself access to all this bad news, right? It's, it's allowing time for quiet and it's allowing time for reflection and honoring your state. That's one. Two, mm -hmm. it's then saying, I'm in the habit of bad news. I'm in the habit of telling myself the worst case scenario is going to happen. I'm in the habit of focus on fixing problems. I'm in the habit of catching people doing things wrong. I'm in the habit of criticizing myself, right? Once you see how tilted you are to the negative, then it's figuring out are there one or two things I can do that bring me joy. Mm -hmm. And all good change leadership, which is basically good leadership, starts with you, right? So start with yourself and say, how am I feeling about this change? Does this exhaust me? Okay, I need to take a moment and honor myself, mm -hmm. listen to my concerns. I have things, tips in the book for, hey, if this is your concern, here's a way to reframe it. 
It's not ignoring it, Mm -hmm. not acting like it doesn't exist. It's just searching for a more empowering, optimistic way forward. It's again, Mm -hmm. it's so hard for people because we think, we think the negative is more real or more true. And it's not. Mm -hmm. It's simply our scouts working overtime of all the things that could go wrong to try to protect us. But so, so it's Mm -hmm. developing a new habit, right? So once you do that, that in, even alone to start to scan for the good, to see things that are going well, even if it's a little thing, that b- b- builds energy and resilience. The other thing is mm-hmm. people being really clear, and you can do this with yourself and then with your people. And again, I used to roll my eyes at this, but not anymore after both experiencing the magic and power as a leader of using this is strengths. What that means is I am clear myself as well as my people, we know the activities that that we love doing that energize us. Doesn't mean we're going to do them all the time. It's just we all know, and they might be a little different. So we can leverage each other when there are things that drain me, Mm -hmm. somebody else might want. Now that's different than a skill. For instance, I'm good at PowerPoint. Thank goodness I can do it, right? It's a skill. I don't love it, but I can do it. Versus Mm -hmm. Excel makes me want to poke my eye out. Okay, that Mm -hmm. drains me. So how do I find people who love doing that? Let them do it. So part of this is Mm -hmm. honoring on your team are people more often than not doing activities that they love or are they doing Mm -hmm. activities they love, but the organization is making it so difficult for them. And then how Mm -hmm. do you as a leader focus on a couple of things and practice shared leadership with your team, which is saying, yes, Let's figure out what are the obstacles right now that we're facing? What are things we can fix or at least speed up? And what are the things that we can't do anything about right now? It's just where the technology is at. And so what can we do to make sure we all are taking care of ourselves? And then it's celebrating success, as you said. It's Mm -hmm. a little thing. Mm -hmm. It's a little thing. And in the book, I have a framework called Great Job 2.0 which really is most people, because again, we're so focused on solving the problems again, and we're paid to do that. That's great. But great job Mm -hmm. 2.0 is simply like, hey, let's take 10 minutes and have a conversation about what went really well, what enabled your success, right? Here's where I saw you shine. Thank you so much. Well done you, right? And what success do you want to preserve that we can take forward? Hey, can we do this in a team conversation so we can celebrate together? Who else helped you? It's these little things that are like 20 minutes, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, again, changing some habits and then also mm-hmm. really asking your team what they need, like trusting the mm-hmm. wisdom of your team so you as a leader aren't working so hard. Yeah. I think, um, you know, that there's so much of this that, that I think is, is really impactful. But the whole time you were talking about, you know, the – the fatigue, it just made me think of how very, very important it is to really believe in the need for and the power of that optimism, right? Because I think there's a lot of people that, like you said earlier, there's a point in your career where you would have rolled your eyes, like, you know, Uh, I think a lot of people feel that way. But when you think about not only what you're saying about the brain is wired, how the brain is wired, but the realities of the negativity that we have all experienced and are experiencing, there is a need to bring more of that to the table, whether it's big things, little things, um, you know, personal things, team things. I mean, I think that there is a real responsibility for leaders to take that seriously and to think about how to harness that power to offset not only change fatigue, but a lot of the, you know, realities that they're facing today. It doesn't erase it all. But I mean, if that's Mm -hmm. something you can do without spending a ton of money, without exerting all of your time that can offset some of that, I mean, why would you not? Right. Oh, well, exactly. Um, it's usually just learning yeah. about it is what you said, because a lot of it is leaders taking a minute and just asking themselves first, what's stopping me from doing this? Mm-hmm. Is it a knowledge thing? Do I know how to do it? Or is it I'm not really sure I buy it? 
And that matters. Mm-hmm. If you don't buy it, mm-hmm. okay, but but you don't buy it probably not because it's not true. You don't buy it because you don't know enough about it yet. So I learned this again. I was lucky being at ADP and then we bought the Marcus Buckingham company. So Marcus has been amazing in the work he's done with Gallup and the research. Really, the the, the couple of key questions that are the things that he's focused in on of data after data after data of the most engaged teams are like, one, I get a chance to use my strengths every day at work. And two, Mm -hmm. like my teammates have my back is a big one. Mm -hmm. Another one is I'm clear, you know, basically what's expected of me. So we talk Mm -hmm. about in all of those compassion, clarity and communication. And again, the leader doesn't have to all of a sudden, I think in our mind, we go to black and white thinking, I have to become a cheerleader. And oh my God, that's no, you do Mm -hmm. not. You simply just have to find your own authentic way of saying, you know, well done. But the other thing that really gets in the way of this is people themselves feel weird acknowledging mm-hmm. their strengths. And what we know, and yeah. you've probably seen this as well, joy, when they've done the research, joy is like one of the least trusted emotions at work. And again, mm-hmm. it's like, wow, we have all been conditioned that we have mm-hmm. to be miserable. And this is what's changing now. The external world used to be a lot more comfortable to go out there and get some feel good right? It's not Mm -hmm. as much like that anymore. And so what's happening is many people now, I believe, are truly being directed inward. And we need to Mm -hmm. find these senses of joy, whether we get it from a a partner, an activity, nature, a pet, just those moments of joy, our brains need to spend like at least 20 seconds in that Mm -hmm. feeling of feel good. So it actually chemically makes a difference as opposed to the rampant anxiety that is nothing mm-hmm. more than a thought or an emotion. It's not yeah. real, most of it. Yeah. I think, too, um, the other kind of excuse uh, that I could foresee leaders having is I'm just too busy. I'm too busy. Yeah. Even if I say I get it, I'm too busy to make time to celebrate small wins because I'm focused on this big thing. And I think you know, what we're talking about today is really the argument that it's too important not to. Like it's, when you think about the intersection of how leaders are leading, and like you said, really every leader is a change leader. And then the issues that organizations have with retention and recruiting and company culture and employee experience and satisfaction, this is what a lot of it stems from. We can't just continually drive, 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 right? People have to feel some sense of reward and um, connection to what they're doing, which comes from leadership, right? So this, I think this, um, super interesting. Um, yeah, can I, I actually I, follow I up on this is, Yeah, go ahead. I want to follow up on that because listen, I honor and fully believe And trust is wisdom, a leader saying, I'm too busy. And so all I would say is, I totally get it. I'm sure you are. Like, there's no need to argue with that. It's like, if you're getting the results that you want with your current approach, that's great. If you're not sure, and you really feel too busy, again, talk to your team. Ask Mm -hmm. your team, hey, I think I'm considering this and I know we're all tired. I would love to hear from you all. So leader doesn't have to do any more work. Like maybe Mm -hmm. there's somebody on your team who's like, actually I have a story of when this really helped me and I'd love this, but it's making it safe for the team. And so Mm -hmm. again, it's simply saying, try an experiment. You don't have to, again, change who you are. You can do your like, I'm not sure I believe this. I'm reading this, you know, I'm reading this book and I look, do we want to mm-hmm. talk about it and try it? Are we all rolling our eyes? And if we don't want to do it, then don't do it. <laughs> okay. Right. But it's like, that's yeah. what I say about shared leadership and like, don't work so hard. As a leader. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So any final thoughts, I guess one final question I, um, have would be if you were to want to surface one major misconception you feel leaders have about how to handle change or navigate change, what would it be? 
I think it is that resistance is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think it, in that one thing, simply shift to say, um, these are just people with good brains. These are just being good humans. And yeah. how do I look at it? Oh, there's probably some really good information there. And now I can become curious as opposed to being like, oh my God, there's a difficult person again. And they may be a difficult mm -hmm. person. I'm not saying they're not, right? But if you can mm -hmm. be like, oh, I trust you. You tell me, what do you think? And just ask a couple questions. That really could change a lot. Yeah. And expecting it, right? And instead of having an unrealistic expectation that you won't get it. Um, yeah, knowing it's normal. It's it's not a reflection, like you said earlier, of a failing. It's not personal. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. So this is the book. Tell everyone where they can find it. That was my Vanna White moment. <laughs> Very well done. So it's on Amazon. You can get it through IndieBound, Barnes and Noble, uh, an audiobook's coming okay. soon. But yep, that's where it is. And also okay. people want more, the more information, they go to my website. And, you know, I do this work because I'm a nerd. As I said, I love it. So executive coaching, if leaders want some training, it's there too. That's awesome. I love people that love what they do. It makes me very happy. Um, yeah. Okay. Excellent. So Elizabeth, thank you so much. I'll make sure the links for the book and for your website are in the podcast show notes. Um, I really appreciate you coming. I could easily talk to you for another few hours. So maybe um, we'll be lucky enough to have you back sometime. I would love that, Sarah. Thank you for the opportunity to connect with your listeners and you. Absolutely. All right. You can um, learn more by visiting us at futureoffieldservice.com. I want to remind everyone that we recently launched the Future of Field Service Insider, which you can now subscribe to. That will make sure that every other week you receive the latest content we have published directly to your inbox, along with some exclusives. Uh, we also recently announced the 2023 Future of Field Service live tour schedule. We will be visiting six countries this year. So have a look at the website to see where we will be and sign up for the event nearest you. Ah, the Future of Field Service podcast is published in partnership with IFS. You can learn more at ifs.com. And as always, thank you for listening.